The three guys who are giving this talk, I think they, they don't need much introduction. They're very, you know, prominent pillars of our community. Um, you know, Tim somehow runs a research lab and then some, and also hacks on, you know, Julia internals all the time. And he did a ton of work on the 1.9 release. Um, Valentin is at the MIT lab uh, and has, you know, been involved in getting releases out and supporting unusual platforms and doing all sorts of really interesting compiler work for, for many years now. Uh, and of course, Jameson is, you know, he was uh, at MIT and one of the first people forced to use Julia in Alan's class and somehow we suckered him into becoming a compiler expert instead of a physicist. Um, so I'm just gonna hand it over to them. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Tim Holy. I'm Valentin Churavi, and we should say all three of us are not CS people originally. That's true. So we have <laughs> one neuroscientist, one cognitive scientist, and one physicist uh, doing compiler work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, uh, happy 10th uh, JulieCon. We're very excited to be presenting, presenting that here. So. <clears throat> And in light of the fact that there may be members of the audience who are um, uh, less uh, familiar with some of the features of Julia. Oh, I'm gonna have to exit presenter view. Shoot, sorry, Jameson, oh, sorry. come to the rescue. Uh, <laughs> How do we start the video? <laughs> oh, it's, now it's decided to do. Very good. Okay, so uh, for, maybe for some, especially on YouTube, who aren't familiar with Julia, uh, the very bare basics, one of the most exciting things about Julia is it's an interactive language. That means we have a REPL that you can launch from the command line prompt. We also have an outstanding IDE based around VS code. And the interactivity of Julia makes code development a joy, right? So you can load packages, um, either that come from the rest of the world or ones that you've written yourself. You can get those packages to give you some data. You can inspect bits of data by printing the information about it at the REPL. You can also engage very, very powerful visualization tools to see your data in ways that would be extremely hard in a statically compiled language. If your code you discover at the moment of sort of playing with things has a bug in it, as long as you've loaded a package called revise, you can just hit a line in the stack trace that you think might contain the error, hit control Q, be taken immediately to the spot in the source code where the bug occurs, fix your error, save the file, go back to the REPL, relaunch it, and then after a greatly zoom exasper or, or exaggerated delay, uh, your code reruns and you see the uh, final outcome of, of the operation. So it makes interactive, uh, organic development of your code uh, a real pleasure. One of the great things uh, that we see in the Julia Lab when we engage with scientists and engineers is uh, that they come to Julia first um, because they hear of the speed and then they stay for the community, for the language, and for the rest of the feature sets. So we need to talk briefly about speed. Um, despite being a dynamic language, Julia is fast. Um, it has been successfully used for large-scale HPC applications. Um, even 2017, Julia joined the Petaflop Club um, one of my favorite quotes of all time is from Katie, where she bemoans the fact that uh, porting her code from C++ to Julia on this GPU was too easy. Um, and of course, you can actually compete with native language with C, C++. You can write fast matrix multiply codes um, in Julia directly without having to go to a native language. 
Another noteworthy big picture feature of Julia is it's an extremely expressive language, and that lets you move mountains relatively easily. One of the favorite examples of mine that I've encountered in my own work is a task of taking a one terabyte uh, movie over time of three dimensional uh, volumetric images, um, and uh, what you're looking at moves over time, and so you want to uh, dynamically align it. You want to be able to send this aligned movie to a, to a, a visualizer. It would take you hours if you had to write that out to disk, but in Julia, you can do this lazily. You can in other languages, too. Um, and in, for example, in Python, there's a truly impressive, outstanding library called Dask. It's the work of hundreds of people, has received a lot of funding. It's about 12,000 lines of code, excluding comments and all those kinds of things. Um, you can do the same thing from bare metal Julia in 12 lines of code. And I promise you, you'll be much happier with the Julia version, because it runs about 40 times faster and is more flexible for future computations that you want to do on that, on that data set. Oh, sorry. This one's me, too. Sorry. Another one. Um, and then I think one of the things that I'm really excited about as somebody who teaches especially newcomers to program is that I think Julia is getting easier and easier to recommend to newcomers. So it's always had some really exciting, or, or at least recently had really wonderful features, the ease of installation, a package manager to die for. Um, what has been a historical problem, which was latency and sort of sluggishness, is getting a lot better. Um, and so, you know, I think that's lowering the barrier for people who have undemanding compute needs as well, and being able to say, no, Julia is starting to get to be good even for that group of people. Um, it's getting, I think, increasingly easy to learn. There are more good learning materials. We're improving our error messages and things like that. One of the biggest areas I think that's still holding it back is that you can't always easily use Julia to write deployable code. And I think once we overcome that barrier, I don't think there will be any technical reason anymore not to say this should be the language of CompSci 101. And uh, Julia is a parallel language, so we will promise in this talk um, race conditions and uh, interruptions for multiple tasks running at the same time. <laughs> so let's talk about the new Julia features uh, that are coming. Um, it's been really interesting also to look at the um, development cycle of Julia. Um, some might know that in February 14, 2012, Viral published a blog post, Julia 1.0, that then quickly got renamed to Julia 0.1. <laughs> um, then over the many years, uh, you might look and think about when did you start using Julia. Um, we then had our first 1.0 release for real now, this time in 2018, and it was a long time support release. Then over the years, releases have been coming at a steady rate to, uh, 2021 is 1.6, it feels much longer ago. Like I feel like I've been living with 1.6 for like a decade now. Um, which is the current um, long-term support release. Um, the most recent release was in May um, this year. And hopefully we'll see at least another release this year for 1.10. It's currently working its way through the um, release process, stabilization, making sure that we catch as many bugs as we can before we put it out to you. One of the interesting crafts to look at, this is the Julia uh, commit frequency on GitHub. And you see that there is an increase in contribution, and then suddenly there's a decrease. And that sudden decrease is 1.0. And what it really meant is that the language was stable enough that we felt confident in saying, hey, by the way, we don't need to change this syntax or uh, that core feature every other day. Um, and people started building large-scale software projects on top of Julia. And this doesn't mean that Julia core development is unhealthy. It just means that a lot of the development has moved out of this repository into the ecosystem and in, uh, into all of the package work that the people have been doing. One of the big things we've heard from people over time is that latency is a really big issue. And so it's something we put a lot of work into in this release to make a lot better. There's kind of two, ki two types of latency that we were looking at. One is the time to load. So if you have a bunch of packages, whether or not you're using them, it costs some amount of time to get them loaded and into the REPL uh, so that you can start whatever process you're doing. And then the second part of that is once you've got all that loaded, actually starting to solve whatever problem you want. And so these were kind of the two key benchmarks that we were looking at this release. And you can see from the graph, we've made a really big increase uh, 
in a reduction in time for both of those. Um, so 1.8 loading plots uh, was 11 seconds. So it's kind of a lot to try to restart the REPL. Now in 1.10 alpha, we're looking at 1.5-ish seconds. And so it's just so much quicker, so much snappier to restart things. But even once that was started, in 1.8, it took another almost 10 seconds before you could see your plot. And that's come down even more to 0.3 seconds. So it's almost just right there as soon as you need it. Uh, this has been a bunch of different things that we've had to do to really get this to work. And so one of the major contributors to the latency was LLVM. We use LLVM because it's really effective at taking whatever high-level code people have written and turning it into something fast. But it takes a little while to do that, and that was a big contributor to the latency. And we didn't have a mechanism to store all of those results. So every time you restarted Julia, it would have to restart from no uh, context. Um, and now that we can... Uh, uh, save those in the background without any change in workflow, we can start up the packages much quicker, and then once they're started, the code is already ready to go. Uh, so that has been a really big reduction in the latency bottleneck. Uh, those are per package, so as you load and add new packages, you only pay the incremental cost of the places that have changed, and then the rest of it is still there. So you can also develop things, have all of that loaded, and then only pay the cost for the additional compilation at the end. Uh, so this does come with some cost. There's additional latency when you install a package. But you have to actually do all of this pre-compilation work. And there's been work to make that parallel so that you can get use of all of these big computers that we now have to do all of that work in parallel. And so um, in addition to all of that work, then because we made it harder for the compiler, we had to go make it easier, faster to load all of that in. So someone created this package called OmniPackage. It's not a functional package. It just loads nearly 500 packages from the ecosystem that all of you have written and combines them together and just stresses out the load time and the runtime system as much as we can. And so stressing it a lot was the amount of time you could probably go make a coffee uh, in 1.8. Now, uh, in 1.9, we should see about 37 seconds. Uh, but in 1.10, that's coming out uh, hopefully in the next couple months. Uh, we've cut that time down again, and we're still working on cutting it down some more. Uh, so we may be changing Jeff's workflow again. We'll see if he has time for email anymore. All right. Now, um, it is worth saying that while the the sort of core features that Julia needs to get rid of latency are starting to be fully in place, there is a little more work that can be done in core Julia. But I want to emphasize that the community can also play a big part in helping, especially pe people who don't know Julia, have a pleasant first user experience with Julia. And the idea is basically is that packages should specify what they want to be found fast for their users, right? And so, for example, if you're a, a, a developer or a user and you're discovering that 1.9 or 1.10 aren't solving the problem for you, you should take a look and see, spend a little time looking and see why. If a key package isn't loading a particular pi a package called pre-compile tools, that's a bit of a tell. Most packages that do demanding things should be using pre-compile tools to shorten latency. It's fairly simple to use. The idea is you include this package, it's really tiny, in as a dependency of your package. Towards the end of your module, typically at least, you put in a small snippet where you're essentially exercising the functionality of your package, right? And that's all you need to do. So this is an example from the data frames package where they just created a data frame and then did some stuff that many users do with data frames. And this took the latency of data frames down by something like, I believe, 20 to 30 fold just by adding these you know, 30 lines, exercising 30 different things you could do with a data frame. So if you haven't looked at this for your packages and you're still unhappy with Julia's latency, you should look into the documentation and pre-compile tools. There are a lot of other tricks and uh, uh, that it can do. Uh, even as a user, if you're not going to contribute to packages or you're using very unusual combinations of packages, there are still things that locally you can do to improve uh, uh, your experience. So check the documentation for details on that. Another um, uh, 
uh, exciting thing that has greatly contributed both to, I think, the quality of the Julie experience, but also helped reduce latency as well, is a new uh, feature uh, contributed by Christopher Carlson called package extensions. So these are sort of a mini package that gets loaded when some combination of packages um, is created. And these are designed to help different bits of, Ju of Julia code interact well together. Julie, one of Julia's sort of uh, a great contributions is the composability of the Julia ecosystem. It's a really extraordinary thing to behold. It's sort of hard to believe before you, know, before you start seeing it in action, but it's a really fantastic thing. But you, nevertheless, there are occasions where you have to do something custom for something you might not want to, including your package. So for example, you might have one package that has some cool things you can do, and another package that creates some nice objects. Um, these packages are completely independent of each other. Many times they can just be put together just fine, but if you need something special to be done and you try to try to execute that and it throws you an error, um, then now, thanks to these package extensions, you can very pleasantly fix this. What you can do is you create a small mini package, in this case added to package A, that gets conditionally loaded if you happen to have package B in the system. So the user doesn't have to know what extra thing needs to be added, it just happens automatically. And now, um, uh, and, and now when you try this, it automatically works for the very first time. Now, in addition to just simply making things work, as you might naively expect or hope. The other nice thing is, is that these package extensions have also greatly contributed to latency reduction. There was an older solution for this called requires.jl that some of you might have used, and, and it worked to solve the same problem, but package extensions really make things just a lot better. You can pre-compile the code that you want for this extension. It also loads more quickly. And so in, in many circumstances, we've gotten several fold accelerations just simply by switch migrating from requires to, to package extensions. One of the reasons why I'm really excited about package extensions is we, in the GPU ecosystem, we have many big uh, packages and uh, it became really unpleasant to load AMD GPU, metal.gl, oneapi.gl, and uh, cuda.gl into the same uh, project and uh, have to install them on the user's machine. And some of these come with like 500 megabytes, two gigabytes downloads that you need to have everything working. And with package extension, we now have the ability to let the user opt in into GPU acceleration and then automatically use it, but you can still write the code that you need to do in order to extend your package for GPU computing. If you want to learn more about this, there's a package called diffiqgpu.gl where we basically wrote a little blueprint of this and um, it now supports all of the different GPU packages without having to have them in the project .toml and load them unconditionally. Um, one other uh, great thing um, also Christopher has been working on is um, freeing our standard libraries. You might have had this exper experience um, of uh, uh, wanting to contribute to Julia and you looked at the standard library and you're like, oh, this could be a really easy fix but it would take six to nine months for me to get that feature. Um, oh, I'm gon just gonna fork the standard library, <laughs> add my fix here, and uh, it's fine. No, we, what we really would like to be able to do is um, have standard libraries that come with Julia, bundled with Julia still, batteries are included, but they can be upgraded independently of Julia. And also faster bug fixes, all the Julia versions will get the bug fixes. Um, it, will hopefully lower the barrier of entry to contributing. Um, they're no longer in the system image, so you don't have an unconditional cost there anymore. Um, and right now, we only have one example of this, but hopefully over the next couple of releases, and this is a call for contribution, um, we can get to a place where uh, Julia will eventually have all standard libraries, um, and even more, I have evil plans, be uh, rechargeable instead of run it becoming stale over time. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what happens to that. Uh, so one of the other features that we have included in the new release, is, this is going to be 1.10, so not yet out, but is a new parser. The old one was uh, has been great. It's been there since the beginning. Uh, but it had some lacking features that we really wanted. So one of them, the, one of the main reasons we wanted to do this is the old parser, if you had a syntax error, such as a missing parenthesis or a missing operand before your parenthesis, it didn't tell you which parenthesis it hit when it thought things were no longer parsable. 
The new one will print out exactly what line of code you had and then draw this little arrow that says this is the parenthesis that you shouldn't have had there. Uh, go fix this point in your code. So that should really help uh, developers, uh, new and old, uh, to get into the language. And then additionally, there's new tools that are being developed on top of this because we have this ability to track exactly which statement and which uh, part of the statement went into the code. We can take code like this that you've written, you wonder, like, what is this code doing? And so uh, we have this tool uh, that you can use. It's several, uh, I don't know when it came out. Several years ago it came out. Uh, so it's called Cthulhu. It's a package that allows you to introspect the code but the way it introspected the code was this rather complicated, like whatever this core dot partial struct. Like there's things going on in here that you may not recognize from the original code. And now with the new parser, it allows it to figure out, okay, this expression that was generated internally actually mapped right back to the syntax that you had typed in. And so you can see it's the original code, but also with all of the types added, and you can see it returned any. And so then you could try to look back into why did this code return any, why is it slow, or what is it doing? Is this also me? Yeah. Okay, um, not the only thing that uh, improved in the REPL, it turns out, this release. We've got new key bindings, so if you hit Alt-E, it'll take whatever you had currently typed into the REPL and say it was some very long, complicated expression you didn't think was gonna get that big, and then it now suddenly is too big for your terminal. That pops open your favorite editor, and you can finish editing that using all of the normal features, and then when you save and close that, it puts it right back into the REPL where you were, so you can run that. You can change the contextual module, so if you're developing some package, you wanna jump into that package so you can tweak it at the REPL. Uh, you can now do that if there's, uh, if you've used some notebooks in the past, you'll notice, you may have noticed they have a numbered prompt. Uh, Julia usually just has the, the word Julia as its prompt. You can now activate that in Julia so that you have a record of all of your past outputs, just has a global dictionary that stores all of the past outputs and you can index that. Uh, and finally, if you want an even fancier REPL, oh, my REPL has now gotten even more features. Uh, and so you can load that up and it will extend some of the REPL things even further. Uh, tab completion is now powered up even more by Julia's inference system. So if you look closely at this code, there's a lot of dynamic behavior here. It's a dictionary. You can go and change this anytime you want. It's a dictionary any. So you have no idea what object type it has in it. And it has arrays of type any in there. And yet, when you index into this d1 of 2 dot, it knows that that was an imaginary number. And so it tells you what fields that imaginary number has and what methods it has without needing to assign temporary variables. Like, it's, it's very cool and clever. Uh, and a few more highlights. Uh, we're now at the point where uh, most or all of our binaries are de developed and distributed through the Igrisil builder. So we have this custom cluster set up that we can manage and provide all of these binaries. And if you've ever looked at the build matrix for this, it is quite crazy how many different versions of combinations of packages and platforms that this has to build for. Uh, so shout out to them for maintaining all of that. Uh, and another cool feature that uh, has landed is now uh, getting globals and setting globals is just a function in the language. So you can poke into the language even more. It's just more friendly to uh, reflection and changes and testing. And uh, so. Hi. Yes. Um, one thing that um, has been asked a lot um, and uh, was a lot uh, of work by uh, a bunch of people um, over the last two releases um, is improving the debugging and the profiling experiences. We have better integration with external tooling. So there's a tool called Tracy that you can uh, um, use to get timelines of what the runtime and what your program is doing. You can even instrument your own code and you can see, okay, the Julia scheduler is messing up here and here I'm mess um, my own code is messing up. Um, the similar integration, uh, better integration with into ViewTunes. Um, we are now disabling frame pointer optimization because it turns out they don't matter and they just make debugging and profiling worse. Um, you can get runtime insights. So uh, if your program is hanging, you can uh, send a SIG info, a SIG user one signal to the process. It will take a profile for a couple of seconds and then print out that profile the soonest possible moment. 
Um, if you are in GDB, you can even ask for, I want to see all of the backtraces that my tasks are having. And um, uh, with a lot of work, uh, the type system has gotten better, which powers our static analysis tools, Jet.gl or dynamic code exploration tool, Cthulhu. And so we try to make those more user friendly, but also we now have more information and we can tell you more about your code. Um, one of the other tools that we've worked on is a heap snapshot. Um, it answers the question, where did all my memory go? So you say, you've been running the code for two weeks and you're wondering why do I have so much memory usage? You can ask for a heap snapshot, you can load it up in uh, the Chrome DevTools. It's not the most pleasant experience, but you are able to answer the question. Um, the allocation profiler, um, I've seen a couple of talks during this conference where people even used it to figure out where are they creating memory allocations. One of the reasons why we needed this was that the previous tool that we had, track, dash dash track allocations, had false positives. And so people were look, using it and then coming to me and asking me, why is there an allocation? I'm like, there is no allocation. Well, but track allocation tells me there's an allocation. So it changes the generated code, the changing the generated code changes the optimization and therefore you get false positives. Um, it's a sampling profiler because otherwise we slow down your program too much. Um, but you can set the sampling rate to one and get every allocation, but we want that will create gigantic profiles. I think it is the default. No. 0 0.0.01. <laughs> <laughs> I think it changed. Um, uh, there's a, a library called pprof that you can use to generate these, um, uh, these flame graphs uh, to analyze it. And coming soon, TM, in Julia 1.11, we finally will have types for all allocations and you will no longer see unknown allocation for some types. Look familiar? <laughs> so, uh, you know, for, for, for many uses, Julia has had, yeah, I would say, reasonable stack traces, but it's Julia's expressiveness and deep nestedness and specialization occasionally gave us real problems in our stack traces. And this is a pretty famous example uh, due to Chris Rakalkas. I'm actually showing you the first frame of the stack trace. <laughs> And only a third of the signature fits on this slide in five point font, okay? So I, some people who are real Lisp aficionados may really like braces, but <laughs> you know the deep nesting here makes this, I think, a challenge for just about anybody. And we're pleased to report that in Julie 1.10, the entire first frame of that stack trace will look like this. You see the dot, dot, dots inside of the curly braces. It doesn't truncate the information all the time, only when it would be really big. Um, and so, and this is done in a nested way so that you can, it goes as deep as it can without filling up your REPL buffer, basically. Um, and so Jeff Bizanson um, uh, is, is the implementer of this feature. I want to talk a little bit now about things that aren't done. I want to talk about one of the most discussed at this JuliaCon. I think as we've sort of checked off other features, the discussions about what else we're missing keep going. They just shift to new topics. And one of the biggest new topics is static compilation. So to be clear, this is not yet done in Julia proper, at least. There is an excellent package called Static Compiler, which will do this in limited circumstances now. You can use it today. But I want to talk a little bit about what maybe at least some of the preliminary thoughts we're having about what this might look like in the future of Julia. So first of all, even the defining static compilation is a little hard because it means different things to different people. Um, what it means to me personally, at least, uh, if I wanted to say it in just a few words, it means shipping Julia without a compiler. Right? So the ability to ship Julia code that can run without the ability to, to compile on the user's machine. So what that means, of course, is you have to compile the code ahead of time and deploy that to your users. There are a number of possible uses of this, which is why there is so much discussion about this. One is, for instance, if you need to ship working applications to customers and you don't want to share your raw source code with them, that's one thing you can do. Another option, um, and I think many of us in the Julia community look at some of the amazing work that's getting done in 
uh, older languages to uh, provide fast things for slow languages. And it's really hard to look at some of those efforts and, and without thinking, gosh, it would be so much easier to develop all that code in Julia, right? And the big problem is we can't deploy it very easily from Julia to other languages yet. But you know, we want to be able to help our fellows, uh, you know, tool users of other languages write libraries that they can use that are really fast using Julia, and that keeps them productive using the tools that they're comfortable with. There are some things that, have, that people occasionally hope about static compilation that I want to show you it's not. It's not a magical way to make Julia code super, super fast, right? Um, it's the same Julia code you know, that, that you would have in, you know, today. And it's not a way to avoid memory allocation. Currently, that's a limitation in the static compiler.jl. You have to have no me memory allocation for that to work, but that's not a feature that it contributes, nor is it necessarily a requirement of a future vision of static compilation. So again, there are many choices we could make about what we want static compilation to be. And I think one of the biggest ones is just, do we want to ship this small library that we call the Julie runtime? It's the thing that supports memory allocation, garbage collection, Collection, runtime dispatch tasks and other things like that, and the and you know basically everything but the compiler, um, and you know the static compiler.jl package has decided to go with the version without even the runtime. Um, I think the place that Julia proper, if I were to make a prediction, we're probably going to go with the Julia runtime library so that we can do things like allocate memory and collect the garbage and dispatch at runtime. There are certain elements of this vision which, at least in principle, don't seem too hard to pull off, right? And the reason for that is because Julia 1.9 already writes shared libraries for all of the package code, right? And so um, we could leverage that capability to write shared libraries that aren't Julia packages, right? And so what we would need is some sort of interface wrapper, a few, maybe, maybe more than a few changes to the actual core Julia source code. But in the end, you could load a package that creates standard libraries. You could load your package that you want to turn into a standard library. And then simply by specifying a couple of essentially entry points into the library, um, th this instructs what you want to make callable by other languages or other applications then the code needed to support these operations could be written to the standard library. This is all, again, this is science fiction. This is in principle where I think it might go. Now, it's not sufficient just to add these entry points to the standard library because these things depend upon other functions, right? The, the my function that you're adding to the library might call a helper function which and many others, which in turn might call their own you know, utility functions, et cetera. And you need all of these to be inserted into that shared library if it's to actually run successfully. Now, in a few circumstances, we think we can already do this, because when your code is fully inferable, we can use type inference to discover all of these helpers that are needed to support your code. So in principle, I think many of the pieces are nearly in place you know, for this vision already. There is, though, a hard problem. And the hard problem is, what do you do when inference fails? Right? So when you don't know what type of argument is being passed to helper function, there might be you know, two, three, four, a hundred different methods of helper function, which methods should, uh, should be inserted into that shared library, with what specializations if you want your code to run fast. And each one of the different methods of this thing might call their own different set of helper functions. So how do you go about discovering what needs to go into the shared library? And this is a much, much harder problem. And I think it's one that we're still having lots of discussions about what strategies do we have available to do the discovery needed here. Um, just to see, get a sense of why this is a pretty serious problem, right? Is what I did was I took a, a very well-developed Julia package. Uh, I stripped out its pre-compile workload and I copied four instructions from it um, as the four entry points to a fictitious shared library I wanted to deploy. And I recorded something called the inference frame gra flame graph. Without going into details, each one of these stacks of boxes is a separate entrance into inference from runtime dispatch. So for each one of these vertical columns, you didn't know what 
that entire uh, stack of boxes was. Altogether, there were 192 separate entrances into inference via runtime dispatch and an unknown number of, of uh, 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 executions of previously inferred code from runtime dispatch. So the conclusion is that the vast majority of the code that you need to turn this into a shared library cannot be discovered from the entry points via inference. That's why this is a hard problem, but we have a a few interesting ideas. It's going to take some time to develop those ideas, but stay tuned. I'm optimistic that we're going to make maybe not you know, complete progress on all aspects of this problem, but I think there will be a substantially good thing that will eventually arise from this, but we will see. Okay, let's... Let's change tag a little bit and let's uh, take uh, an update from the accelerated computing ecosystem. Um, the GPU ecosystem has seen a lot of development over the last year or so. Um, we now have much more robust um, support for a lot of the vendor libraries. Um, AMD GPU has done a lot of latency work and performance improvements. Um, CUDA got easier to install. Um, and uh, we now have um, major support in kernel abstractions for all of these backends so that you can write device-independent code in Julia and then choose to deploy to whichever supercomputer you want. One caveat is, um, and we noticed this in a big uh, recent HPC application, is the latency improvements that are equivalent to what package image is now for Julia proper. They are yet to come. Hopefully, they will materialize, but that is a lot of work, and we will see when that will happen. Viral is uh, uh, saying that um, one of the nice things about the GQB ecosystem in Julia is that it's the easiest to install. And I have heard this from multiple engineers within those companies that for the f they tried it out and they were surprised that they just worked. None of the other stacks just work. One thing I'm really excited about, and there was a talk at the StudioCon um, about this, is that uh, Julia now runs on IPUs. This is a new kind of processor developed by Craftpore. It's a multi-instruction, multiple data processor with many cores. Um, we now have a working prototype of writing code in Julia and then compiling it to that target architecture and executing it. And we are the first programming language that is outside this Graphcore maintained ecosystem that is capable of doing that. And it's really a success story of how we are using and leveraging LLVM to make these kinds of targeting new and weird architectures possible. <laughs> and as uh, Chris is saying, one of the really nice things is that we can take in non-trivial packages from the Julia ecosystem and actually run it on the IPU without having to port them. Uh, one of them is being differential, equ uh, differential equations, um, and even you can do AD on these devices. All right, so a quick update to our threading roadmap. This is the slide that Jeff showed last year of where we felt like we were in progress. And then you can watch the checkbox checks change here. So we've taken some of the work that we did, and we feel like we did even more work, even better too. And other parts we've uh, finished that we didn't even have on the roadmap last year. And uh, so I think the one place we're still looking to improve is with the thread safety of the runtime system. We've gotten a lot done in the last few years, but we think there's still a few bits that we're still working on to get there. Uh, one of the significant improvements to multi-threaded code now has been garbage collection it is multi-threaded. So if you're running a multi-threaded benchmark, in the past, it would just switch to single-threaded to do the garbage collection. And if you have a bunch of threads allocating, it can take a lot of work for one thread then to do all of the garbage collection. With all of the threads working on it, that's no longer the bottleneck it used to be. We see some really significant improvements in performance on uh, a handful of benchmarks that we created basically just to stress the garbage collector and see how slow could we make it. Uh, and so there was versions of the code where you were getting 70 plus percent of your code was just spent running the garbage collector. And now that's down to 30% of the code. So much, much more reasonable. Now actually it's doing whatever the intended functionality of that code was. Um, well, uh, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> now, some very biased highlights um, uh, to finish out this talks. Um, 
we should congratulate all of you because you've been writing code and push, publishing packages. And um, we have 1,700 new packages since last year, 22,000 versions. What are you all doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, we, uh, if you want to look into those details and if you want to figure out how we come up with these numbers, uh, there's a great uh, discourse post um, about the package download stats. And I think Mose also gave a talk um, about like looking at the package ecosystem at this conference. Um, one highlight that I want to make is we now have Julia codes that are running at scale on some of the largest supercomputers in the world, targeting very diverse GPUs. So on the left graph here, we are targeting NVIDIA's GPU ecosystem, going up to about 2,000 GPUs. On the right-hand side, this is Europe's newest supercomputer, Lumi. Um, we are running on AMD's hardware, um, we're up to 512 GPUs, and we're getting very nice parallel efficiency. That means we're making good use of the resources and we're not losing t um, time. Um, one of the things that has gotten me the most excited is when I see unintentional um, com combinations of my projects. Um, so Paul Teed uh, gave this fantastic talk about um, accelerating black hole imaging. You might re remember the bus a couple of years back about this picture here on the left-hand side. And he mentioned that it take, took them about a week of compute on a cluster um, in C++. And then due to Julia and due to the availability of differentiable programming, he was able to get this down to a laptop, one thread, one hour. <laughs> of course, it's, it's not just that Julia is magically faster, but um, more that it allowed for the development of better algorithms and using better tools to solve the problem. And uh, apparently this is uh, something new that I hadn't seen before, is uh, that he's now going the next step and saying, well, now I have so much more compute time that I can waste. Uh, can we make the pictures even prettier? <laughs> And um, as I said, we only gave a very thin slice um, of what is happening in Julia. There are a lot of Julia organizations um, that work on different parts of the ecosystem where people come together and collaborate. And this is just some of them. Uh, at some point, they will no longer fit on a slide, and I'm sorry. Thank you. That is the end. So we we have time for questions. We do have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned a lot of things around you know improving uh, uh, improving latency through pre compilation, right? But one of the bigger issues, uh, one of the new issues that's come up because of that is increased pre compilation times, right? So are there things in the pipeline for profiling pre compilation and understanding what is taking time to pre compile to be able to help packages to improve the pre compilation times? Yeah. yeah. So there are two things that happened. One of them is in Julia 1.10, we parallelized. Um, the pre-compilation, which reduced the time if you have a parallel computer. If you don't, if you're on a two-core laptop, I'm sorry. Um, and then uh, some of the work that Cody has been doing is about giving visibility into what we are actually doing at the runtime and what uh, methods are getting compiled and how much time is being spent. And uh, I think we will get more and more insights, but the question is also how do we make those insfo insights useful and actionable? Hi. Uh, like you mentioned, it's been, it feels like a decade since 1.6, right? <laughs> and uh, there have been quite a few releases since then in just uh, a few years. Uh, I use Julia in an enterprise uh, setting, and we need to stay on the long-term re uh, support release. So when do we get all these cool features in the next LTS release? No comment. <laughs> We, we've been having internal discussions, and Stefan is eager to jump in. Um, I think there will be one in the next couple of releases, but we will see which one precisely. So my, my comment is you don't use the LTS. It's, it's fine to use the LTS, but I think people are way too conservative about it. It's, it's very reasonable to be on the like latest, you know, one of the latest releases. <laughs> the comment from the audience was that we had a user who has just moved from 0 0.4 to 1.0, uh, 1.6. <laughs> so uh, the performance improvements are important to everyone else in the room. 
Um, as a small-scale hobbyist programmer, the couple of things that I care about are being able to uh, have my documentation and my testing all work from a single environment rather than having to keep multiple manifests in sync. And um, the improvements to macro hygiene that Dave Moon suggested. I mean, so one of the things that has happened in 1.9 is there are actually additional tools for um, limiting the upgradability of versions of packages and their dependencies. So where it prioritizes reusing previously compiled versions of that. This is a user setting, so you can do some things yourself to try to, um, to, 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 try to uh, uh, you know, reduce that, that amount of pre-compilation time. With respect to changes in macro hygiene, I'm not really qualified to comment on that. I think that, I mean, one comment is simply is that deep changes like that don't sound like a Julia 1.0 feature because we do insist on backwards compatibility. Hey. Just yet to answer the second part of your question, the improvements to macro hygiene that David Moon suggested, uh, I don't know, years and years ago. Uh, I have a prototype of macro expansion which does that. <laughs> there, there's a draft PR on juliasyntax.jl if people want to look. Um, it might work if you try it, but it might not. <laughs> uh, hi, you said about freeing standard libraries. Uh, so could we, uh, in the future, if we don't want them, can we delete them? And will there be all numbered versions that um, so that com you you put in compat in your project to mode so and you all you also keep the compatibility so new Julia versions so yes um we they will just be like normal Julia packages they will come with Julia because that's part of what um users expect they expect that using statistics actually works um they will come with Julia but they will be upgradable, you can pin them independently, you can switch versions independently, um, and that should all work, just like normal Julia packages. Uh, Last question. Uh, I'd, I'd like to know if there's been some plans for the debugger, because I, I, I've, I've used it and I find it a bit brittle okay. <laughs> compared to other languages. It would be great to have a more user-friendly debugger. Yeah, so, okay, I, I, first of all, I fully agree with that. So, um, so, one of the, so one of the challenges with the debugger is the debugger is, in, is interpreting a intermediate stage of the compilation chain. And from a standpoint, so there, are, I, would, I would say that there are two big problems with our current debugger. One is it's slow, and the second one is that it, um, it sometimes has a level of granularity that you probably don't want, right? And in particular, one of the most famous examples is all of the internal machinery for keyword arguments you occasionally sometimes step through. Now, I assure you, on every single new Julia release, I have gone through and updated a pattern matching algorithm that attempts to detect is this next blob of code probably due to handling keyword arguments, in which case I'm gonna lie to you about, I'm just gonna jump over the whole dang thing, basically. But that breaks with every single Julia release and sometimes misses specific patterns. And so, first of all, file bug reports if that pattern matching isn't working. I know it isn't working on 1.10 right now because I just got bit by it myself. Um, but uh, we, if that, will, that one will be updated. I'm super excited about Claire's work on, on Julia Syntax because it's the first step in the process to being able to annotate the code at different stages of the compiler pipeline to say exactly which bits of source code this came from. And if that gets integrated, all of that complicated reverse engineering of this lower code probably came from this can just go away and we can reliably step through the code as you, the creator of the source code, would be expecting. That does not solve the other problem with performance, but I think again, once those annotations are in place, 
We may be able to write faster debuggers that work on an even later stage of the compiler pipeline, like after type inference and maybe after Julia's own optimization passes, in which case I think we, I'm, I'm hoping we'll get at least a several fold improvement in speed. It's still not anything like compiled code, but I, I do think there is a path forward to making it a better experience. It's, 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 a, it's a pretty mixed experience right now. I'll, I'll grant you that. But, uh, but I do think there are ideas there. They're just hard. It, there's a lot of engineering that has to happen first, but I think we're on the trajectory to make that happen. Um, I wanted to just make a quick comment about this slide that you know we have a lot of beautiful art in the Julia ecosystem, yes. and a lot of it is thanks to Cormulian, who's here for his first JuliaCon. <laughs> so, thank you.